Hello everyone, it's January 5th, 2016, it's Tuesday, it's Harp Tuesday, and not just any Harp Tuesday, today is, it's kind of special because not only is it the first Harp Tuesday of 2016, it's episode 100, and that's, that's a, that's a pretty big number, it's, it's pretty cool, um, I, I'm quite proud to have gotten to episode 100, and of course I'm very thankful to all of you for coming along for the ride, and so for this episode, Next week I'll continue my look at uh, Fantasy on Green Sleeves, but for this episode I thought I would do something special, and this is an episode I've been thinking about for quite some time, and it's uh, a look, some advice, some thoughts on buying a harp. And throughout this episode I'm going to be uh, kind of coming from the point of view of somebody buying a harp for the first time, because I think that's where one is most in need of information. The, the longer you've played the harp, the more you kind of get a sense of what you want and, and what you like and what you don't like. And when you're buying an instrument for the first time, of course, you, 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 there's so much that you don't know. And, and, and it, I just think, hopefully, that this will contain some useful advice. So uh, I, I'm going to organize this episode into sections, and you'll be able to watch the whole thing through or watch each individual section, and you should also be able to see some annotations, some links, uh, to the various episodes, so if you or sections, so you can go to the spot you want to go to. That may not be visible if you're watching this on your phone. Um, so without further ado, uh, let's get started. So first of all, I just wanted to offer some general advice and, and a sort of a synopsis of what I'll be talking about later in terms of buying your first harp. So um, first, my first advice would be to talk to your teacher. Um, you don't need a harp in order to get a teacher. You can approach a teacher first and say, hey, I want to learn the harp. And they will probably have some great resources for you. Maybe be aware of harps for rent or used harps. That might be a great option. Um, and be there to give you advice. And, and that would be just a great resource. Um, if you don't have a teacher, or maybe there's not even a teacher available where you live, um, perhaps there's a professional harpist who might at least be able to offer you some advice. Um, and of course, there's the internet, which is a great resource. Look at some of the mailing lists and some of the groups and stuff like that, and videos such as this. Um, second piece of advice is don't buy a harp. Rent a harp to begin with. So obviously at some point, if you're enjoying the harp, you'll want to purchase a harp just because you might as well have that money going towards a harp of your own. But um, renting, I think, is a wonderful option to begin with because you don't have to find the perfect harp. You just have to find a harp that you'll be able to learn with. And even if you rent for a month or two months or three months, it gives you so much more information. You'll be able to see, first of all, do you like it? Is this something you want to continue and to pursue? Uh, secondly, you'll have a little bit better sense of what it is that you like about this harp, maybe what it is that you don't like about it, and a better sense of kind of what you're looking for. So that would be, again, a great piece of advice, I think, is to, if, if possible, where you live, see if there's an option to rent. Um, then the third piece of advice, uh, is, or this is more sort of a synopsis of what I'm going to talk about in the next couple sections, is you're probably going to want to buy a lever or folk or Celtic harp rather than say a pedal harp. Um, and if we boil that down to how many strings and how many levers, my, my, my suggestion in, in a nutshell would be either to go for sort of the cheapest option, which would provide you have enough strings to actually do something on. So maybe say 26 strings, no levers, or go for a 34 string fully levered harp like this, say, that is the type of harp that those specs are the type of specs that might last you for your life, entire life or whatever. I mean, you know, that, that um, is a harp that will definitely let you really uh, explore the harp and discover what it is you, you want to do. So next I want to talk about three broad categories of harps. Um, so I'm going to kind of lump harps into these three categories. First category would be pedal harp. They're kind of standardized. They're made by companies generally. Um, they're the harps you see in orchestras. Uh, 47 strings is sort of the standard. They range maybe 46, 45, all the way down to maybe a 44 strings, very small pedal harp. Um, and the thing about pedal harps is they're very expensive. So sure, maybe you could get one used for $10,000 if you're lucky or something, but new, you're probably looking at 15, 20, 25, $30,000. So 
uh, just like a grand piano, you're probably not going to buy one to begin with. And technique can transfer from the smaller harp to the bigger harp. I started on this harp, for example. And so I won't focus on the pedal harp. I will have a section about pedal harps, but for most people, when you're looking to buy a harp, especially your first harp, it's probably not going to be a pedal harp. Then the next category would be the lever harps or Celtic harps or folk harps, variously referred to. And these um, range in size from very tiny little lap harps to like 40 string harps that look like small pedal harps. Um, and uh, they're made by individuals, by hobbyists, by small companies, by large companies, uh, all, all over the map in a much greater way than say pedal harps. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that in depth about what you're looking for there. And finally, the third category would be sort of other harps. So these are things like cross strung or triple harps or wire strung harps, um, things that I don't have that much experience with. So I'll just touch on that briefly, offer a few thoughts and uh, in that about that third category. Lever harps, part one, how many strings? So when we're looking at choosing a lever harp, the number of strings could range from a very small little lap harp, maybe even 14 strings, all the way up to say 34, 36 or 40 strings. And uh, there are seven strings in an octave, A through G, so plus eight, eight strings to get A to A to get an actual octave. So if you divide the number of strings by seven, that gives you the number of octaves. This is 34 strings, so that's almost five octaves. This little lap harp has uh, 24 strings, so a little bit more than three octaves. And you can see if I place like all four fingers on each hand, I don't have a lot of room to go up and down, right? I'm a little bit, there aren't as many options, right? We get a little bit restricted in terms of what we can play and especially what keys we can play in as well. Um, just because uh, like if we're in the key of C, we have this low C, that's great. But what if we're in the key of say G, do we want this low G or if, or maybe we're staying up here a lot, then we're kind of ignoring these bottom four notes. So suddenly it's the harp is essentially much smaller. Um, so there is definitely a minimum number of strings where if you get too few strings, you're, you're really kind of handicapping yourself and you might find that after even two lessons, you, you're just, you're running out of room, right? So 24 strings, that would, I think, kind of be the minimum. Uh, there's some nice 20 sing, 26 string harps, uh, harpsicles, uh, dusty strings makes a nice 26 string harp. Um, that I think would, would really kind of be the minimum I would advise. Um, and then we go up to say a 34 string harp like this, 34 and 36 are, are kind of standard harp sizes. And, um, uh, one thing to watch for is, does it have the low C? So that's, that's kind of important that it's much more useful to be 33 strings and have the low C than 34 strings as they only go down to a D just because a lot of pieces are written, assuming that this low C will be there. And of course, many pieces are written in, in the key of C where, you know, it's nice to be able to play that octave or that low C down there. Um, so 34 strings is great. Uh, you, you know, um, for me, uh, I, I got a pedal harp two years after I started playing, and this is the harp I started on. And it wasn't the number of strings that I found was restrictive. It was the lever system, which we'll talk about in the next section. And I wanted the access to the pedal system. So yes, it's nice to have more strings sometimes, but uh, 34 strings, I think is, is, is again, a, the type of harp that might last you your entire life and will definitely let you fully explore um, a lot of different music and a lot of different options. 36 strings obviously is great. Generally, it'll be a couple of string, extra strings up here. Um, there are some larger harps. Lion and Healy, I know, makes a lovely prelude, which is 40 strings. It's got a few lower notes down on the bottom, which is kind of cool. Extra resonance, extra sound. and But it's also kind of more of a specialized instrument, maybe for somebody who has been playing for a while, knows that they don't want or don't need the pedal system, but wants a bigger harp and more strings and more sound. So again, if you're just starting, um, depending on circumstances, right? Like maybe there's this great... 38 or 40 string harp that falls into your lap, but um, it's not necessarily 
necessary to spend extra money, 34 string or 36 string will do you do you well for several anywhere from you know two years to the rest of your life. So um, anyway, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea. Again, it's possible to have too few strings. It's not possible to have too many, but you don't necessarily need, especially when you're first starting, more strings past say 34. Celtic harps, part two. How many levers? So originally, when, when companies first introduced the lever harp, they all had levers, but then eventually people realized that you could offer a cheaper harp by not including the levers, because there's the cost not only of, of the lever itself, but also of installing it and making sure it's in the perfect position. Um, so nowadays, you often get an option of, say, no levers, a certain number of levers, maybe all the C's and F's, or a full set of levers, one on each string. And what they do is they raise or lower the string by half a tone. So this is C natural, middle C. If I move the lever up, it goes to C sharp. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm too far away from my camera to be able to zoom it in, but uh, hopefully you can see, or maybe you can see some other videos showing that close-up action. Um, and there are various different levers, types of levers. Um, so, that's what the levers do. Do you need levers? Well, there are two things that we use them for. One is to be able to play accidentals. And that is, that's uh, the name for when normally in the piece we're playing, say, a C natural, but it's maybe one time we need a C sharp. And if we have no levers, you know, we can't do anything to change that C. We can't whip out our tuning key and change the tuning in the middle of the piece. Um, so with the levers, you know, we can play it and then change it and then change it back again when we need, you know, back to the C natural. Now, that may or may not be a, a restriction because uh, I'm, I'm thinking, say, of the Betty Prey first harp book, which I like quite a bit, I, I, I use quite often. And it was written, I think, more with a pedal harp in mind, but there's maybe three or four pieces in it that require uh, an accidental, a lever change. So not very many. Um, you can play most of the pieces in there without without uh, changing any levers, without any accidentals. Um, folk music, like traditional music, Celtic music, generally doesn't have any accidentals. Um, obviously stuff like jazz or classical music can tend to be quite chromatic and would need uh, levers. Um, so you can certainly find a lot of music that doesn't have any accidentals. Great. But then the other thing that levers do is they allow us to easily change the key so in other words, right now we're in E flat. Um, to get to C, we'd put these up. If we want to get in the key of G, we'd also put the Fs up to sharp. Um, so that's really easy between pieces to do that. We can do the same thing without any levers, but we have to retune each. So let's say we want to go from G back down to C. We'd have to retune all the Fs back down to natural. Um, imagine I'm holding a little tuner which is somewhere around here. Um, <clears throat> so that gets old pretty fast. And what often ends up happening is we just look for music that's in the key that a harp is tuned in. We can transpose music, you know, take music that say was written in G and move it to C. So in other words, instead of playing a G, every time that the G is written, we'll play a C instead. Um, and, and with all the music notation software, that's certainly possible. Or if you maybe you're a great musician from some other instrument and you can do that in your head already, <laughs> more power to you, awesome. Um, or maybe you're playing by ear and you can just pick it out in the appropriate key. Um, but I think what you will find is that not having any levers is going to put some restrictions on you um, in terms of the repertoire that you can find. And uh, it's also kind of annoying to always just be playing in one key. It's sometimes nice to have a slightly different sound of a different key. So um, not too bad to begin with, but I think it will start to start to bother you. Um, <clears throat> now, there, so there, there's a halfway option, as I say. Sometimes harps might have, say, uh, an F lever, because often you might go from C to G. Well, it's better than nothing, right? Um, or maybe an F and a C because traditional music often is in, 
G and D, which two sharps is the D, as opposed to say F, I think it has to do with how a guitar, but which chords are easier. Um, so you won't as often have a B lever. Um, so these options, you know, they're, they're better than nothing. Um, but as I mentioned in my synopsis, my feeling would be that um, I wouldn't necessarily want to go halfway, right? Uh, I'd rather go with no levers, and again, for on a smaller harp, right, try, try to get yourself sort of into the harp world with, say, a 26-string like harpsicle, for example, with no levers, um, that you know you're going to probably outgrow, but that is kind of the, the most inexpensive option. Um, or go ahead and get a full set of levers. So, uh, yes, it's possible that if you're only playing, say, traditional music, you might find that, say, just an F and a C lever do you, that's fine. But eh, it might be worth that extra money to get those extra levers on there. So anyway, that's what the, those, that's what the levers do. My recommendation would be go to zero levers or all levers. Um, and especially as you start to get to, say, a, a bigger harp like the 34 string, I would definitely say get a full set of levers because, for example, if you ever want to sell it, it's a lot easier to sell a, a normal fully levered harp than... A 34 string harp that doesn't have any levers. Celtic harps, part three. Uh, structural integrity and ergonomics. So before we get to talking about the sound of the harp, which of course is very important, it's also worth being aware that there's a fair amount of pressure on the frame of the harp and you just want to make sure that it's built well enough to last, right? That the design and the woods and the way it's put together is something that will stand the test of time. So yeah, this is especially true, I think, when we're, because with the uh, with, uh, lever harps, we're dealing sometimes with companies, right? Which the big companies, they obviously, their design has, has st the, stood the test of time and they typically offer warranties, right? Um, but we also are dealing with individuals because there's all sorts of individual craftsmen um, who make some wonderful harps. And in that case, it's, it's worth, you know, just finding out, do they offer a warranty? Um, how long have they been making harps? Can you talk to some of their their uh, people who own their harps? Uh, it's worth being aware of, right? Just to make sure that, and search online as well, you know, just to double check and make sure that the harp, uh, as I say, has a fair amount of pressure. Now, I'm not a harp builder. Um, I don't really know what to suggest you look for, but that's just something to be aware of. Um, <clears throat> then the ergonomics, and that's important as well. So, um, this is uh, another reason why you might want to get a slightly larger harp, say a 34 string harp, rather than some of the lap harps. They can be difficult to play. Like this lap harp doesn't have a, a stand or anything. So right now I'm just holding it on my knees and you can't actually see that very well, I guess. But it's, it's a little bit awkward, right? I have to like grab it with my knees. I could put a, there's a hook for a strap. Um, sometimes people have little sticks that they rest them on. Or I could set up, and I can kind of do this here. I got it sitting on a little stool. So I could set that up. That would be my, can you see that? Yeah, that would be my best option. I think most comfortable, but ergonomically, it can be a little more difficult to get a good setup. Whereas a, a, a bigger harp, it can be better. Um, now, one thing to be aware of is that, uh, so let's see, ergonomics, we're gonna talk about the proper height. This is very important, right? Um, we want to ideally, we might have a shoulder right here under the join between the soundboard and um, the neck. So um, for me, right now, this is actually a little bit too low because I'm sitting on a, a slightly higher bench. I'm sitting on my bench for my pedal harp. So ideally I would be sitting on a lower chair, but ideally for me, I would actually have this harp be a little bit higher. So something to be aware of then is can you see? Right. So this harp has these legs on the bottom. Um, if it didn't, if it was just resting on the floor, that would be much more difficult. So, and, and various harp makers will offer legs perhaps of varying heights. Um, but I, you know, while we could be sitting on the floor, be sitting quite low, in general, I think ergonomically it's best to have our knees at least, a, you know, just a little bit below our hips. Um, so for me, ideally, this might be a little bit higher. And um, again, we can always 
sit on a slightly higher chair, it's a, so it's not always so great to sit on a slightly lower chair. So just being aware of can you get a comfortable height on the harp. Um, harps should be designed to balance quite nicely on your shoulder so you don't feel like there's any weight on your shoulder. This pedal harp right, weighs about 75, 80 pounds. It feels like there's very, very little weight on my shoulder when I have it tilted back because it balances very, very well. Um, so just be aware of that. And again, perhaps if you're feeling a lot of weight, maybe that's because you're too far away from the harp or, you know, you're, or you're in a bad, bad position in terms of the height. But can you find a spot where it balances nicely and you feel like there's no weight on your shoulder? Um, also, just the general weight of the harp and depending on your size and, and, and your circumstances, you may want to go for a, a lighter harp, um, especially say, obviously in a, uh, something that's becoming more and more popular or, or common in North America, at least is um, therapeutic music, uh, certainly on the harp. Um, so playing, for example, in hospitals or hospices. And there it's great to have like a really light little harp that maybe doesn't even have any levers and that you can just move around easily. You're not playing particularly um, complex music, right? That's not really what you want to be doing. Um, and so there you're looking for something that's quite light. So just being aware of, of the weight of the instrument. And again, if you figure you're not going to move it around, it doesn't matter so much if, how heavy it is, but it certainly shouldn't feel heavy on your shoulder. Um, be aware of the design of the soundboard. So actually all these harps are rounded soundboards, uh, uh, rounded sound boxes, um, but a lot of lever harps are square. And I think that has to do with the fact that it's easier, right? Certainly I, you know, I would know how to go ahead and make a, a you know, like a square box, whereas to make the rounded box, I think is more difficult and perhaps more expensive. Hence the reason for the, the square backs. Um, but what can happen is that the square back may, you may feel like it cuts into your shoulder a little bit, or that as you reach around, um, maybe it's more awkward to reach around. So just being aware of those ergonomics as well. Um, and you know, how big the, the, the sound bo or sound box is when it's on your shoulder. Um, obviously the bigger the sound box, the more sound we get, but if it's too big, again, maybe we feel like we can't reach around depending on our size. And maybe we feel like it's it's cutting into us more or something. Um, and finally, the final ergonomic tip I would suggest is checking to see how much space you have as you go up the harp. So what can happen is that as you get up to the last few notes, you can feel like it's pretty restricted. You know this, and that's inevitable in most harps. But um, it will vary. Like a Lion Healy's pedal harps, there are some years where there's very little space, and some where there's a lot. And you would prefer that there be a lot of space, even as you get up here towards the top end of the harp. So worth worth checking that as well. Um, and that's all I've got for ergonomics. We'll move on to sound. So choosing a Caltech harp, part four, sound. So sound, of course, is in the ear of the beholder. We're looking for something that we like, right? I'm going to offer you a couple uh, a couple of words, a couple of sort of opposites when we think about sound and uh, opposite spectrums, right? On the one hand, we have bright and on the other hand, we have dark or, or maybe rich. So, and both of them both have a good aspect or uh, a bad aspect. In other words, when, when something sounds bright and it's good, it, we might describe it as bright or bell-like, right? Or, or uh, crystal clear. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's got a ringing, bright, beautiful sound. Um, and when something's rich or dark, maybe we think more it's that uh, rich, like rich, I think is a, is a great adjective, um, just that we're swimming in sound, right? Ah, oh, beautiful. Um, and so those are kind of two opposites. You might prefer one, you might prefer the other. For me, I tend to prefer rich rather than bright, but obviously a good harp or a good instrument will sound good regardless of which spectrum it tends towards. Just that's something to be kind of aware of both as listening. Is this a bright sound or is this a rich sound? And which do I prefer, right? Which do I prefer? 
Now, as I say, both of them also have sort of the, the, the that's when they're, when that is good. When it's bad and it's bright, we might instead think that it's tinny, right? Or it's, it's thin sounding, uh, and, uh, that, um, so now, it, or, 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 or pingy, right? That, that it just, it's, it's, we hear a sharp attack, but it's, it's not a nice attack. It's not a nice sound, right? Um, and on the, then on the flip side of, of rich um, or dark, it might be um, muddy or indistinct, right? We're, we're, we're just, uh, we can't even hear the attack, right? That, and that, um, or thunky or whatever. So, um, so listening for that too. Um, uh, just some words to kind of describe what we might be hearing and what we might like or might not like. Obviously, we also want to uh, feel as if there's enough sound, right? That it the, the, that, that that it's uh, loud enough and rich enough, or, or loud enough, and and you know that, that we're able to create sound on it. Now, it can be very helpful if you're actually able to play on the harps you're thinking about to have somebody else along, you know, maybe your teacher or another harpist who can also play on them and maybe listen to them without knowing which harp is being played and get a sense of what sounds you like. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So, um, if you can't listen to the harp, it's much harder. You, you know, some companies have sound clips. Um, you can obviously listen to stuff on YouTube, but it's not the same as being there in, in person. And I mean, I, it's potentially better than nothing, but I, I, I yeah, I, I'm not convinced that that's always that helpful. Um, also, of course, different people can create different sounds out of the same harp, right? That's always kind of interesting. Um, but anyway, using those adjectives perhaps is a way to think about, um, what sound you like and does this harp, uh, produce that sound. Um, and one of the factors, of course, that will affect that is what strings it has. So let's go on to that. Celtic harps, part five, strings. So I would say the majority of Celtic harps are strung with nylon strings, but some of them are strung with gut. Uh, as you get down to a certain point, neither gut nor nylon sound very good. So we get these steel strings and that remains pretty consistent. Um, I, I would avoid the nylon wrapped strings uh, kind of like this has on the bottom. Um, I, I think they just don't sound that great. So as you get lower, you do want the, the wire strings, but in terms of nylon versus gut, um, it's both a sound issue and an ergonomic issue. So as, as far as sound goes, they kind of, they're on the opposite side of the spectrum. The nylon strings will tend to sound brighter and the gut strings will tend to sound richer. So for me, I prefer the gut sound, um, uh, but both can sound good. Um, and then ergonomically, nylon requires less tension. So the tension on the strings tends to be less and that can mean that it feels easier to play feels like we don't have to play quite as hard in order to make a sound, to create a sound. Uh, on the other hand, with the, you know, with the gut strings, so this is gut and this is nylon, by the way, um, with the gut strings on, uh, on a pedal harp with a concert harp tension, where it's designed to be played in an orchestra, cut through an orchestra, you can apply a lot of force, right? Uh, I guess you can't really see, sorry, but I can really put a lot of pressure on these strings. Whereas here, I might feel like I'm just going to rip them out of the soundboard, right? Can't apply quite the same amount of pressure. Um, so I love the tactile feel of the gut strings at the concert tension. But that's, you know, that, that's me. Um, for many people, they'll, it will be nice to have that l lower tension on the harp with the nylon strings. And in particular, of course, if you're dealing with, I don't know, arthritis or something like that, then having nylon strings is going to be perfect because you won't, you certainly can do a, a nice big full motion, but you'll be able to produce the sound even with a small, with a small motion. And again, this isn't designed to be heard through an orchestra and in, in concert situations, often people will mic their, their lever harps, their folk harps. Um, so, uh, 
anyway, just some thoughts both on ergonomics and on sound. Um, and then the final thing to be aware of is that uh, gut strings, of course, are more expensive. They're quite a bit more expensive. They're more expensive initially, right? Um, several times more expensive than a, than the equivalent nylon string, but they also break more frequently. So not only does it cost more to buy them originally, you'll have to replace them more often. Um, to me, right, that's worth it. I love the sound of gut. I have gut all the way up. Some people only have, some people have nylon their top octave in the lever pedal harp or even nylon the top two octaves. Um, but uh, I can absolutely understand having nylon and you know, yeah, they, they last forever um, and uh, easy to play. So anyway, just a couple things to be aware of when you see something that say has gut strings with constant tension, that's what it means. It's gonna require a little bit more strength to play, though hopefully the payoff will be there. Like it, that it'll, you don't wanna feel like you have to work and work and you're not getting any sound, but what you might feel is you have, that you have that ability to work and then you get an amazing sound. Um, and, uh, if a harp has gut, you could probably, I believe you could string it with nylon. If it's strung with nylon originally is intended for nylon, you might want to check with the manufacturer if you want to string it with gut, because that will require that you're putting more pressure on the frame of the harp, um, and potentially cause problems. Again, I'm not a harp maker, but something that's worth checking, checking on, um, Anyway, just just uh, just some things to be aware of, both in terms of sound, the brighter sound of nylon, the richer sound of gut, um, and in terms of ergonomics, the the maybe the to me more enjoyable uh, tactile sensation of gut, as opposed to the the less resistance and the easier to play sensation of nylon. Pedal harps. So pedal harps are quite an invention. They have these pedals, seven pedals on the base that change the pitch of the string by moving these discs, say for all the C strings. To go from C flat to C natural to C sharp. And that, of course, frees up both hands to be playing while well, you can create accidentals, play chromatic sections to some extent. Um, so it's essential, like if, if you're looking at playing the, the classical harp repertoire, if you're, you know, obviously you'll need a pedal harp. Um, if you uh, want to play jazz, it's going to be a lot easier on the pedal harp. Um, you know, the, the, certainly you can do a lot on the lever harp, and there's more and more material that's being written for it, but uh, pedal harp certainly does give you more options, plus more strings, and a bigger sound. Um, and yeah, amazing, amazing instruments. So what should you be looking at in terms of buying a pedal harp? Well, um, of course there's a number of strings. 47 is the most and kind of the standard. And the 46, all the way down to maybe as few as 40. Um, uh, there's also a s extended soundboard or a straight soundboard. And then it can be a little confusing because, you know, the, these uh, student models or professional models and like, what's the difference? And I, I, I wish on these manufacturer sites that they specified exactly what it is that you're paying for. Because, uh, you know, I have no problem with saying, okay, this particular harp, yes, it's 47 strings, extended soundboard, same as this other one, but this one, the, you know, the, the wood that we use is not as good in the soundboard, so it's not gonna sound as good, but it's cheaper. Great, that's a, you know, that's a, a trade-off that one can understand, but it's not specified, right? Um, and obviously sometimes the reason that one model is more expensive than the other is because of the extra work that's done, um, you know, the ornamentation, the carving, the gold leaf, etc. But sometimes uh, I think it also has to do with the sound or the construction of the soundboard. And I wish that was more uh, plainly stated so that we had more information, right? Because again, that's a fine trade-off to say, well, okay, I I'm going to get this harp. Yes, I understand. Maybe it's not going to sound quite as good, but it's that's what the harp that I can afford. Um, but it can be confusing looking at and trying to figure out, well, you know, what's the difference between this harp and this harp? if all we're going on are, say, the number of strings or extended soundboard, whatever. Um, so just like any instrument, there's no substitute to getting a chance to actually play on it yourself, checking out the ergonomics, you know, does it feel comfortable for you, um, and checking out the sound. And in terms of the number of strings, um, you know, that's, that's, that's going to depend. Um, 
it's going to depend a lot. So, uh, obviously, the, the ones on the bottom, the ones on the top, don't get played that often. But they do get used. Um, my own personal feeling would be that, you know, I, I, I'd, I'd want to spend a little bit extra money and get that 47 strings just because I might need it. And, I, I mean, for me, obviously, I do need it. Um, that being said, it's quite possible that you might never miss you know, might even go down to 45 strings or something and not miss those extra strings. So it's going to depend partly on, partly on you, where you see yourself going with, you know, with a harp. And um, also, you know, if, if, if you're doing a lot of gigs with this harp, right? If you're moving it a lot, hey, maybe you want like a 45 or 44 string harp because, yeah, you're, you're not playing maybe concert repertoire. Maybe you're playing background music or weddings and stuff like that. And so the repertoire that you're playing doesn't need it. And the fact that it's smaller and, and more portable, oh, it's a huge bonus, right? Um, so, uh, you know, I'd love to have another another smaller harp that would be a great one to just move around. Um, so, yeah, so I, I can't tell you for sure. Um, uh, again, my own inclination would be if you're if you're kind of on the fence, would be to go ahead and get the the full size. Um, but yeah, you never know. Um, speaking of moving them around, the other thing to just be aware of is check the weight. Um, I don't know how accurate all the manufacturers' websites are, but they do tend to list a weight. And just be aware of that because, um, again, depending on what you're going to do with it and how big you are, for example, you may enjoy having a lighter harp rather than a heavier harp. Um, just something to be aware of. Um, and other than that, again, talking with other harpists is great. And, uh, and just trying to play on as many different harps um, as possible. So, and, and listening for the sound, listening for the feel, or seeing how it feels. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, my, my thoughts on pedal harps. So finally, I'm gonna talk about that third category I mentioned. So these are more unusual harps. These are harps I don't have a lot of experience with, um, but it's worth being aware that they're out there. In some cases, they might require a slightly different technique or a completely different technique, but you might find that that is the harp that resonates with you and that that's the type of harp that you want. Um, so anyway, I don't really have any advice in terms of, of, of buying them and what to look for, but I they're, they're kind of interesting. I mentioned them. So there's things like the, the double strung or chromatic harp where you've got two sets of strings and one are like the black keys in the piano one and one are the white keys. And by stringing them like this, the right hand has access to both sets of strings and the left hand has access to both sets of strings. Or there's uh, triple harps. And I did an interview with Robin Ward who plays and makes triple harps. And I got a chance to play on it briefly. Uh, very confusing. It would definitely take a little bit of time to get accustomed to it. You got three sets of strings. So the outside sets of strings are the white keys. And the middle set of strings are the black, uh, the black keys, the, the accidentals. So, you reach through and and play them. Um, there are wire strung harps, right? The sort of very traditional, uh, you know, medieval or, or uh, early Renaissance harps, where the all the strings are wire, so quite thin wires. You go up and they're played uh, with the fingernails, and quite a, a, quite a different technique. And you're often doing a lot of dampening because uh, there's a lot of resonance. Uh, I believe. Again, I, I don't have much experience. Um, at all. And um, there are, uh, of course, there are electric harps where the technique is pretty much the same. Um, often they're just acoustic harps with individual pickups on each string, but there's also some, some frame, wire frame harps where there's not really, you couldn't play them without plugging them in, um, just like electric violins or stuff like that. Uh, so that's kind of cool, but as I say, the technique is kind of the same. Um, so just some, some more unusual harps to be aware that they're out there. Um, I don't have any advice to offer, but uh, kind of cool. Um, so that's it for this episode, and I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've found some of this useful, and I will see you again next week as we continue a look at my fantasy on green sleeves. Cheers.